So welcome to this episode of History Hunters. I'm in Auburn, which is the county seat of Placer County. This town dates back to 1848. We're gonna go check out some of the historical sites here. Wow, check this out. This is a giant statue of the man, Mr. Channa, who discovered gold here a little bit after James Marshall discovered gold in 1848. And oh my gosh, somebody put a bunch of bottle caps in here. It's all full of gold bottle caps? Yep. This is in memory of the man who discovered gold here in 1848. And here we go, it talks about Claude Chana or Chana. He was the first fruit rancher in Placer County in 1848. He found a gold in the Auburn Ravine, which led to the settlement of a mining camp that later became Auburn. Over here, it's a couple of ore mining carts and some hydraulic equipment. This here is a dredger bucket from a giant gold dredge. I believe they discovered gold down in this creek. It's impossible to look for gold here because they keep people out. Well, look what the gold dredge brought up. Fool's gold. Fool's gold or a fool? I understand that the first memorial to President Lincoln was the Lincoln Highway that was made in 1913. We're going to check out this little monument here on the side of the road. It talks about and actually has a piece of the highway. So what I remember from school was that in the 20s, cars were for rich people. And when the idea of the Lincoln Highway was proposed of building a continental road across the United States, there was a lot of opposition from people who said, why would you build a road for rich people? And so politically, it was not something people wanted to support. So dedicated in 1913, the Lincoln Highway was the first transcontinental road for automobiles in the United States. It winds its way over 3,000 miles between New York City and San Francisco, and it came right through here, right through Auburn. It's a piece of the old concrete from Highway 40 that they cut out and saved. This is a magnificent this, piece of this, Highway 40. This right here? This is history. What I'm touching? You're touching history today <laughs> on what History I'm... Hunters. This is an actual slab from of Highway Cal 40. Of California. Check it out. And I was totally wrong on the dates. 1913. I'm touching history. The atoms in your body are 13.7 billion years old. You're saying that I'm a billion something years old. Your atoms oh, are. Cute, that Protons and neutrons and electrons in your body, you're 13. Okay, I still control. think it's pretty bad that you call me a, that, that old. Well, <laughs> this collection of arrangement of atoms is not that old. So what about the slab of the highway back there? Is it as old as oh, I am? Is that the yeah. most awesome slab of history you've ever put your hands oh, on? It's pretty awesome that uh, I'm as old as dirt, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, Sarah, they've been asking about your whereabouts. So where are we at? We're at Bloomer's Cut. Yes. Where they cut a hole in something that has to do with the railroad. <laughs> That's all I got for you. We're at Bloomer Cut. It was a significant milestone in the railroad. They started out building the Transcontinental Railroad in 1863. 
they decided on a route through Auburn here. They found out that the incline was too steep and they had to cut a swath right through the hill. It was 800 feet long and about 63 feet deep. It was completed in 1865, primarily done by Chinese laborers with picks and shovels. Can you imagine? This, this ground is very rocky, so it was a very difficult task. It took them a very long time to do that. We're gonna go walk up there and check it out. They say it looks just like it did back in 1865. There's actually a trail down to the railroad, or the Transcontinental Railroad, join the east and the west. We're on an ouch. We're on an ouch. Yeah. <laughs> My son says it's very scary looking over this thing. 65 feet deep. Holy s***. Wait, what? That, all done with pick and shovel, and there's a lot of rock in it. So there we go, there's the famous bloomer cut. It looks just like it did back when it was finished in 1865. Can you imagine Chinese laborers digging that out by hand? Pick and shovel. Oh gosh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whoa. I wish I would have known I was gonna traverse. Why? Because I went into war these. That's hard. Continues to erode. Isn't it? Isn't it kind of, kind of neat the fact that these rocks generally look like it haven't fallen. There's a couple that are loose. But it sure looks like it's sediment. Oh. Sh <laughs> these rocks are all round. Yeah. But they don't look round like like a creek weathered them round. They have little river rock. Are you sure? Because. She looks like river rock. Like, well, how would it have been? Oh my gosh. These walls don't look like they'd be very sturdy, do they? They're not. Look. No. We. Wow. <laughs> Turn up history. You wouldn't want to like... be here in a... I wonder if it's collapsed and blocked the way before. It must have. I don't think so. They said it's pr pretty much the way it was back in the old days. <laughs> So it's interesting to think that the train that's featured in the very famous picture where the west part of the railroad and the east part link up at Promontory Point, Utah, that train passed right through here. Uh, it's very possible that Leland Stanford went through his, here as well because he's the one that drove in the last bike at Promontory Point, Utah, May 10th, 1869. It's absolutely essential that that be cut so that the train could pass through this area. I would imagine what happened was that they engineered this and didn't consider that this hill here would not have been navigable by a steam engine. They did use dynamite on occasion to get through this, especially when they encountered large boulders. I understand that on April 15, 1864, they were using a crowbar to do something with the, the explosive. It detonated. The supervisor was injured. A Portuguese man died from his injuries and a Frenchman lost his eye. So I don't know about you, but that courthouse back there has got to be one of the most awesome courthouses in the United States. It's just a county courthouse. It's also designed by the same guy who designed the San Francisco City Hall. The cornerstone was laid July 4th, 1894. Believe it or not, this fountain was brought here in 1908, and it's said that dogs and horses and human beings drank out of this. Of course, it was in a different spot because it would have been a lot lower. They put it here at the entrance to the courthouse. This fountain was once in the middle of the street, but was moved once automobiles came on scene. This fountain cost $3,000 and was paid for by the sheriff of this county, Sheriff Neff. When it was placed here in 1908, he died the following year. This plaque here talks about this being a historical landmark site of the first public hanging area and graveyard. This is a third county courthouse. 
You can see there the cornerstone was laid July 4th, 1894 and dedicated four years later. It took four years to build this. Sarah and my son are underneath this magnolia tree. What do you think of that courthouse? It's beautiful. I'm gonna fly the drone. Have fun. So a little history lesson on Placer County. It was formed in 1851 and its first courthouse was made of wood and canvas. It was a crude little thing with a jail next door made of logs. A two-story wooden courthouse came after that in 1853 and served the county for the next 40 years. And in 1891, Placer County awarded a bid to a John Curtis to build a new three-story masonry building similar to the ones he had designed and built for San Francisco, Santa Cruz, and Sonoma counties. To build it, they had to roll the old courthouse aside to make way for the new structure. This courthouse cost a whopping $173,000 fully furnished back in the 1890s. The building was proposed for demolition in 1976, but the citizen thankfully rejected that idea in a ballot measure, and it was refurbished in 1986. Let's take a run up the stairs here. I'll show you what the courthouse looks from way up here. Very ornate. Let's see if we can get a shot here. It's almost like a state capitol. I think what's cool is they put so many ornamental features into the buildings. I still say this is one of the coolest courthouses I've ever seen. It's just amazing for such a small little mountain community like this. So whenever we're in Auburn, we have to eat at this restaurant. It's the best pizza in Auburn, or probably California for that matter, but it's really cool. Because right over here, you've got a sleeping desperado. He's in jail. He's usually snoring. He's got his guitar down here. You can see he's got his gloves on, probably because it's COVID around here. He's masked. He either robbed a stage or he just doesn't want to get the coronavirus. I'm right, right? This is the best pizza around? Yeah, this is my favorite pizza so far. Usually when we go anywhere, we try to hunt down a pizza place that's not like the big chain restaurants. So this building behind me is a kind of a cross between Independence Hall and Kentucky Fried Chicken, but it's neither. It's Auburn's historic firehouse that was actually moved here from a couple blocks away. It dates back to 1894. I understand that the upper floor was used as an office for the water district around here. Go right here. It talks about this being erected in 1891. I was off by the volunteer firemen of Auburn Hook and Ladder Company, number two, with funds raised by public subscription, dedicated May 21st. 1892 and continues use until 1954. Awesome building. There you go, there's the fire engine inside. 1914 Buick. Do you want to know what's fascinating about history? That this picture can turn into this picture with little changing. There you go, that's a classic County Bank, 1887. So this, uh, as you can see, this is this is original. Look at that fluted columns with ornamental architecture here. And here you go, the building with a brick front. Happy Hour Liquor Store. There's the old Wells Fargo office right here. And I believe there's a plaque on the wall right here. It talks about it being the express office from 1852. And the Hall and Back Bank. There you go with historic brick from 1852. There's the Auburn. Old Town Auburn Post Office, Gold Leaf, 
talks about. First post office established July 21st, 1853. Stationed here since the late 1870s. Now the Sun River Clothing Company. There you go. This is the site of the Empire Livery Stable, established 1864. It's now the Old Town Gallery of Fine Arts. Do you like Auburn? Yes. What do you like about it? It's cute. It's old. Kind of like me, huh? Old. <laughs> It stopped by the Auburn Depot, built in 1898, restored in 1989. Sarah has found another statue over here of a Chinese man working the mines. There's a couch. You want to hang out? What'd you find? A couch. No, what is this? A statue. Looks like a Chinese guy in a wheelbarrow. Let's read this. Dr. Kenneth Fox crafted this statue from one mile of reinforced steel rebar and 35 cubic yards of concrete. Chinese coolie stands 22 feet high, is 33 feet long, and weighs 70 tons. He was relocated to this site in 1989. Chinese did a lot of work on the railroad. They also did a lot of work mining. There's a bunch of junk in there. There's old boots. Some kid boots down, or maybe they're even slippers. I wonder if this is a mail car. I think they caught mail with this thing. Just think, part of the Transcontinental Railroad right here. Earlier I was telling Sarah and son Aiden about the significance of the Transcontinental Railroad, which was essentially the first highway from the east coast to the west coast that enabled such a tremendous growth out west, including California. For a building that was constructed in 1894, this Oddfellows Hall looks in remarkable shape. It's located here, right across the street from the Lincoln White Grammar School. The bottom floors were rented out to businesses, while the top floor was solely used by the Oddfellows. So this building on High Street may not look special, but it is. It is the old Auburn City Hall and Fire Station, completed in 1937. Franklin Roosevelt's Works Projects Administration funded this building, and now it is preserved on the National Register of Historic Places. It was Auburn City Hall until 1990 and was also a fire station, but part of the building right now is the Placer Tourism Office. So if you recognize the style of architecture, it's Art Deco, which was very common in the 1930s. Even the lettering up there, it's got a very 1930s look to it. Wood was often used to create cement molds. So oftentimes on these buildings, you can see strips of wood patterns along the cement. After the cement cured, they just pulled the wood away. So we were zipping down Lincoln Way and had to stop and show you this awesome state theater. It opened in 1930 with Sunny, starring Marilyn Miller. I think it's just an incredible art deco facade. They restored it, I understand, in 2014 as a local performing arts and cultural center. It's just a wonderful building with a seating capacity of over 1,300 people. I think we've found more Ken Fox statues. There's about three of them here. It's got some little feet. Little feet. You know what that means? There's a giant woman. Got an arrow. This guy also has an arrow. How would you like to live across the street and have to look out and see that every day? Out your bathroom window. Hey, honey, what are you looking at? Oh, nothing. But we just arrived at the old cemetery. We just got here, but did you find anything good? The Heinz ketchup people. Person. No. I know. Beer man. Adolf Beerman was not into beer, but he was into bread as the town baker. But this man right here, Conrad Johnson, was buried in 1898. 
he was into beer. He was a business partner who distributed beer bottled in Sacramento. So buried right here is L.P. Burnham, who died February 9th, 1890. He was listed as a bachelor pioneer of Auburn, who was here in September of 1849. He owned the Mountain Gate Mine in the Damascus District of Placer County, I understand, or about seven miles southeast of Dutch Flat. So this is the grave of George W. Watson. He was a World War I serviceman who was killed in 1918 at the Argonne. So Griffith Griffith has one of the largest tombstones here in the cemetery because he owned the local rock quarry. He was a native of Wales. He came to California to try his luck at gold mining in 1853, but found out he was better cutting stone, so he established the Penryn Granite Works in 1864. Some of his granite is actually in the state capital in Sacramento. He died in 1889. This is John Garrison's grave plot. He was born in Maine in 1830. At age 14, he ran off to become a sailor and eventually sailed to California in 1850. It was a 175-day voyage to San Francisco, and he did some mining up here. I understand that he was a butcher and a storekeeper. So at a place called the Horseshoe Bar, his door was inundated by the floodwaters on January 1862, and he only survived by cutting a hole through the roof to escape drowning inside of his house, believe it or not. He then lived another 46 years. Dr. Alfred Kucher was the city health director during the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic. He caught the flu himself, but I understand that he didn't die from it. He died from a gallstone surgery the day after Christmas. This is the grave of Joseph Filcher, who passed in 1925. He was Auburn's first school principal. At age 14, he came to California from Iowa across the prairies in a prairie schooner or a covered wagon. Filcher became owner and editor of the Placer Herald newspaper. He was actually one of the framers of the state constitution here in California, and he was a state senator. Filcher always signed off his column with advice to young readers. Boys, whatever you undertake to do, do your best. Be honest with yourself and others. Tell the truth and never lie. I did find the grave of Joseph Walka, who was the Lieutenant Governor of California from 1857 to 1859. He came to California in a covered wagon in the spring of 1849, first settling in Auburn, where he operated a store. Later, he grew the first crop of wheat in Placer County. In 1868, he was editor and proprietor of the Placer Herald up until his death. Here's Dr. William B. Niles, died in 1887. He was just 47. Well, here's Mary M. Snyder, wife of Reverend S. Snyder. She was just 28 in 1876. And etched on this stone here are her last words. Tell them I am happy. And the Andrews plot is here. I thought this 1877 marker was kind of interesting with the ship anchor. It's one of those made of zinc or pot metal. On this side, you can see it's a woman, Catherine Elizabeth Andrews. I understand she was a school teacher who got ill suddenly and died in 1876. A rose on this side. Here's the grave of Eliza Filcher, who died in 1878. She was actually born in England, and her husband Thomas and her came out west in a covered wagon in 1859. And they encountered all kinds of hazards, Indians, hordes of bisons, the dry periods through the desert. They actually lived in Marysville where he farmed. But when she came here to visit, she died here. The grave says she rests in peace. I don't know how she can because the train just ripped through here a little while ago and it was really loud. Well, like it is today, life was incredibly short back in those days, probably even shorter. This native of Scotland, Thomas P. Martin, died in 1882 at the age of 49. This was a baby who lived for one day in April 1899, yet his tombstone, plaque, reminds us about him today. Charles Holman. I wonder what he would have done had he lived. Here's the grave of Kate Crosby, 1889. And on this side, we have Bartholomew Crosby from 1829 to 1904. 
I understand that he owned a blacksmith shop that was destroyed in an 1870 fire that started in the Central Pacific Railroad Depot. And on this side is an Uncle James Comer, who was born in 1849. Here's a really early grave, that of a David M. Pearson, who died in 1860. It says he died in Peru, which is a mining camp in El Dorado County. Peru doesn't exist anymore. We missed two significant graves, that of the infamous outlaw Richard Rattlesnake Dick Barter and Deputy George Martin, who were both killed in a July 11, 1859 shootout in Auburn. Barter's crimes included the February 1857 burglary of a Wells Fargo safe in Fiddletown and robberies of three stagecoaches. Martin was killed and Under Sheriff Johnson was wounded. Barter was hit twice and tried to escape on horse, but his suffering, I guess, was so bad that he committed suicide outside of town near present-day Lincoln Way and Forest Hill Road. He had died hoping that he killed his law enforcement nemesis, Deputy John C. Boggs. Before he shot himself, Barter scrawled out a note that read, If Jay Boggs is dead, I am satisfied. We encourage you to visit this amazing town born of the Gold Rush era and see for yourself why it has a charm that really can't be caught on video. Oh, and who knows, you just might find Sarah and I some weekend at Old Town Pizza right there in that beautiful downtown.